Good evening. Um, my name is Amy Nieser, and I work in research IT. And I'm here with my colleague, Anna Sefman, who works in the library. And we work very closely together on a program called Research Data Management, where we help researchers with all of their data needs. And one of many things that Research IT and the library has in common, and why we work so well together, is that we work with researchers from across all disciplines. Um, and that's going to be a very important aspect of our presentation tonight. So um, part of what I do in Research IT is I manage our consulting program. And as we are out on campus consulting with researchers, we hear a lot of new needs around virtual machines and containers. We get a lot of questions about both of those topics. And we notice that most of those are coming from researchers who are working in the STEM fields. And we suspected that um, there are probably a lot of other researchers out in the world that could benefit from these technologies that maybe either don't know about them, don't know ways in which they could use them, or maybe don't have the time or technical expertise to be able to build or spin up or maintain uh, these complicated technologies. So that is what led us to our research project that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, before we dive into that, I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about with uh, virtual machines and containers. Um, so we grabbed these definitions from IBM that we liked a lot. Um, and so a virtual machine is a software that really emulates a computer system. Um, so if you need to run software on a different type of hardware or operating system, a virtual machine is a really great option for you. And we see that a lot when we're working with researchers who maybe have a Windows computer and need to run a piece of software from Mac or something. It's usually the other way around. They have a Mac and need to run some Windows software rather than having to go out and find a Windows computer. They can spin up a virtual machine and, and get what they need. A container, on the other hand, um, packages everything together that's needed to run the piece of software rather than spinning up the uh, operating system itself. So it includes all the code, its dependencies, and possibly even the operating system itself. Um, they're able to run on a similar OS uh, or in a VM. So what's the difference between those two? What it really comes down to is that with a VM, the team creates a virtual environment where the different types of software can run, whereas a container isolates the software from the environment itself in a way that enables it to run most anywhere. So that's what a virtual machine is, that's what a container is, and that's the difference. So why are we talking about this? Um, like I said, we work with a lot of researchers who have questions for us about these technologies. Um, they're really nice because you can install them once and run on multiple computers or even clusters. It's a really big benefit. Um, they're very easy to share, replicate, and cite. And um, Anna and I are both librarians by training, and so that makes us very happy. Um, so similar in a way that you would cite a journal article or a book, um, you can actually cite a virtual machine or a container that you used from a different researcher, and that researcher would get credit for it. And then finally, you can uh, run software that requires one operating system on a machine that has a different one, like I mentioned before. So we wanted to understand if researchers are searching for these virtual machines or if they're building them themselves from scratch. And we started investigating why, why would somebody search instead of just build? And um, as I alluded to before, not all researchers are familiar or comfortable with the technology that's necessary to do such a thing. It's, it's quite complicated. Or even if a researcher can build her own VM or container, that is time spent learning that and having to go through documentation and dealing with that rather than working on the research itself. I was just having this conversation with somebody earlier about taking away research time. And that's really what we try to do both in research IT and the library is we try to take on some of this technical burden so that researchers can really focus on their research. And then finally, why reinvent wheels? If there's a virtual machine or a container image out there um, that's even part of the way of uh, what a researcher needs, why go through the hassle of learning and building and spinning up your own if it already exists? <coughs> 
So then we thought, we anticipated this question from the audience um, or from researchers, isn't it impossible to find the perfect pre-built VM or container for my research? <clears throat> Every researcher's work is different um, and very unique. Um, so probably yes, but not in all cases. And even if we were able to, or even if the researcher was able to search for a virtual machine or a container image that was, say, 80% of what they needed for their work, um, that's better than starting from scratch. So I think last fall, fall 2018, um, we identified a number of department and UC Berkeley organization listservs and we tapped into our librarian friends to, uh, to give us these listservs so that we could reach a broad number of people for whom our research might be relevant. And um, again, we were really interested in looking at user behavior around uh, searching and using VMs. So we sent out an initial survey that asked just a few basic questions, I think it was four or five, it was relatively short about how people are searching for um, their VMs or containers, how they're discovering them, and how they're using them, and really what they value as part of this research workflow. Um, we also included a couple of demographic questions to get a sense of who was responding and what, um, specifically what field they were in. And then we, would, we asked if they'd be willing to take part in a focus group, um, during which we could learn more about their behavior. And we offered to provide lunch, too. We had a lot of interest, and we had um, a lot of follow-up emails about our topic. Despite that, we had a pretty difficult time getting people to commit to um, coming to a focus group. But that said, the, the, really the qualitative data that we got from those who did attend was really interesting enough for us to continue working on this project and to continue looking into some of these topics. So I want to highlight here that we really wanted to be as inclusive as possible. Um, we know that um, that some people who are more tech savvy, maybe in the engineering or physical sciences, are really comfortable in these areas. But we also know that people who are less tech savvy want to be using VMs or containers. And we know that people in the social sciences um, are also using VMs or containers. So we wanted to be inclusive to them as well. Um, so ultimately, we were able to talk to five people for our, our focus groups. So we held three focus groups, two of them were in person and one was virtually. Um, and we started out our time with them by learning more about their current research workflow and then also further defining what we wanted to get done during our 75 minute time with them. We asked them more about their selection process. So when they know that they need an image, what, what do they do? Do they go to Google and Google virtual machine or are they at a level a little bit beyond that and they know exactly where they needed to go, maybe go directly to Docker and start searching there. We wanted to know what terms they were using, where their starting point was, and, uh, and what they looked for in their selection process. So following that initial discussion, we presented attendees with a list of 22 characteristics, which is a lot. Um, but we put those into six different categories to make it a little bit more approachable and understandable. And then we asked them to select their top three to five characteristics that they value when they select whatever VM they're going to select. Following that activity, we led a couple of discussions to learn more about their choices. So this was our um, ranking activity results, and it's not a surprise that um, they all thought that finding the VMware container that included the software, exact software that they needed was very important to them. But the three that really interested me were how do they define trustworthiness and authority? What does ease of use mean to them? And, um, and then also uh, reproducibility and archivability. Is someone else going to be able to grab a citation, say for a VM, um, and go back and reproduce some of their work? So we dug more into this assessment and, and trust. Um, they were more likely to select a VM if it was affiliated with a corporation or a university. Um, one of the attendees said that if the developer was from Amazon or VMware, then they were more likely to trust their work. Um, they also liked if there was maybe a video on YouTube or a README that accompanied the VM. Um, the more documentation, the better here. 
They also liked recommendations from other users. And finally, they talked about um, if the VM included a citation that they could potentially use in a publication. And one of the interesting things that, that came, came up here um, is that they talked about the use of GitHub and the number of stars that a, any given uh, repository on GitHub has. You can't really go into GitHub and figure out why someone starred something. Maybe they start it because they um, wanted to come back to it or follow it or they thought it was really great. Or maybe they start it because they wanted to highlight it in their blog later because they thought it was a hunk of junk. I don't know. But I think this is um, uh, gets into the, the area of alt metrics, which is really interesting in the library world, how people are actually um, quantifying uh, the value of something. So um, our next steps, Amy, I was out on maternity leave, uh, was able to attend PERC and, U the, and uh, the UC Tech Conference uh, this summer and talked to a lot of folks about this project and um, really pulled in more interest. Um, so we want to get a greater response rate at UC Berkeley. Our, our survey response rate was good, but our focus group response rate was just, you know, it's just the starting point. Um, so one of the things we're going to do at Berkeley is reformat this um, this study to administer it online. And then we've talked to a number of other folks from UC campuses, and we want to look at how this might um, be administered on some of the other campuses so that we can see more of a system-wide approach to services that, that these institutions can offer in supporting um, VMs and containers for researchers. <clears throat> so we would like to open this up for a little bit of discussion. Um, I guess we're first would love to hear from any of you, if you are researchers who are working with virtual machines or container images, we would like to learn about your needs, your workflows. Um, or maybe you're somebody who supports researchers, like Anna and I are, and um, we're wondering, have you seen this kind of need as you're out on, your, on this campus or your campuses um, talking with researchers? And um, as Anna said, we really, delved into the assessment and the trust aspects. Those are some things that came out of our um, discussions. But we're wondering from you, are there other things that we should be asking researchers um, that we should be thinking about as we embark on this next phase of the research project? So I'd love to hear from you all. Uh, Ron Sprouse in linguistics, um, where we have used virtual machines for several years now, uh, basically to provision software to graduate students for doing phonetics. Uh, uh, for one of the reasons you cited, uh, some of the software isn't available for Mac or Windows, so we have a Mac machine that we provide to them. Thank you. Lovely to hear um, somebody from linguistics. Is that mostly for educational purposes or for research? Research. For research. Yeah. Great. We would love to chat with you more if you're open to yeah. that. Thank you. Anyone else working with these technologies or working with researchers, these technologies? because we're actually moving our high performance computing documentation off of our website onto GitLabs. And we looked very much at GitHub um, and compared the two. And I wish that the consultant who helped make that decision was here. Um, looking at Jason, yeah, he's shaking his head. I, I wouldn't want to comment on yeah, that. Yeah, I believe <laughs> where we landed was that GitLabs is more open, I want to say. Um, do others in the audience have comments about this? Yes. I mean, there was a, a lot of you know hand wringing when Microsoft bought GitHub, but the reality is GitHub is where the critical mass is, yeah. um, and the reason GitHub was successful is that the phenomenon of 
being able to see everybody's code in one place and making it easy to do comments back and forth and this the, the fork and pull model of being able to contribute to any project. So that, you know, I, I'm relatively neutral, but that first mover advantage is going to be a really difficult one to overtake. Um, and I, I haven't seen any reason to sort of drop it for philosophical reasons yet. Not everything Microsoft does is going to necessarily be evil. Right? Yeah, definitely. I would be happy to follow up with you after this. And, and we um, have an enterprise GitHub, which I just learned about yes. like a month ago. I didn't know. Like, GitHub's that work at EDU. Did mm -hmm. people know about this? Mm -hmm. I'm always the last one to find out. <laughs> but there's more of these sessions. <laughs> um, but so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm from the computer science department, and you know, we're, we're the department that has the famous you know, 2,000 students per semester going through our introductory courses and stuff like that. Um, every one of the lower div courses has its own platinum level org on GitHub. So there's like a CS61A organization, a CS61B organization, a Data8 organization. GitHub gives us all that for free. Um, but my fear is that if we moved all that to campus GitHub, it would collapse. Uh, because the, the workloads, the number of repos is just astronomical. Yeah. Um, we'll but, talk. Well, yeah, yeah, I was going to say. I mean, the, the, there'd be a lot of good reasons for us to move it to the campus one if we mm -hmm. could. But we just, we're, we're a little bit afraid. Office, so. yeah. Well, I would be happy to follow up and look through our notes of what, what the reasons were why we chose GitLab. Um, but we did have a very in-depth, yeah, multiple Not the least which was a really easy conversion over. Mm -hmm. So that was a very direct yeah. um, time saver. We also checked in with our colleagues at NERSC, and NERSC is using GitLabs as well. And so that was a factor also. Other thoughts or questions or suggestions about this? What else should we be asking uh, researchers throughout this study? Mm -hmm. Especially with regard to um, the category of reproducibility, appearing high up there. To, to what extent are people's interest in, shall we say, aggregation in general, mm -hmm. aggregation for not just computational tools, but data as well? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how does this concern with the yeah, so containers interact with, with access to either close by data, similar, especially like mechanics and social sciences, or external sources? Um, I think mean, one of the things we've been figuring is, is a database, a SQL database. Where's the data coming from? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably the bigger question. You bring up a very good point, and um, and a few of you have probably heard me say this, but I often live in the the world of the ideal and what I think we should be doing with our data and doc how we're, how we should be documenting workflows for purposes of reproducibility versus what people are actually doing and what they actually value. And one of the things that came up here is that um, reproducibility and and citability is something that's nice, but it's not on the forefront of everyone's minds. Um, at the library and library partners, we work very hard to educate researchers on the, the ease and ability that they can implement certain practices in their workflow to make their data available and to make the platforms on which they work available um, so that others can go back and either check their work or uh, reuse their data or their code and analysis for, for whatever reason that may, um, that may augment their current projects. Um, so I think it's part of this larger ecosystem of, of research reproducibility and, um, and developing an entire ecosystem. I think that the data world is further along in this way. I think we're really shifting the culture um, to make data more reproducible and citable. And so um, that's why we dug into this. That's our background and we think that the virtual machine and container um, world could learn a lot from the work that we're doing on the data landscape. Yes. I wonder, you know, as you get more data about you know, the ways that people are managing virtual machines <coughs> and computers, will, will, you, will you end up with some kind of best practices? Because I, I just suspect it's kind of the wild, wild west out there what people are actually doing. <laughs> I would love that. Um, again, as a librarian, I'll say that a million times tonight, one of the things that I'm constantly thinking about is how we can teach researchers, students, whomever else, how to, um, how to analyze their resources and analyze what they're using and think about um, why they're choosing what they're choosing. And so if we can come up with 
um, some kind of guidance or best practices around selecting images um, that could at least get people started in, in thinking in the right direction that would be really useful. There are other possible features as well, and we definitely need a lot more data before we would even start going down these paths, but um, you know, it might look something like maybe we have a library and it's a whole bunch of different images and here's one for the social sciences and here's another one for the social sciences and that researchers can go and check out uh, uh, an image in the way that they check out books or something like that. But again, you know, we've talked to a very small number of people and we need to learn a lot more about um, the user needs and requirements before we would um, go down a path like that, but um, depending on what we find, maybe it'll come out as a best practices toolkit, maybe something else. Um, so we're very um, open and interested to learn in this space. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, since this is an inter interdisciplinary discussion, I don't know if uh, some of you are aware of some uh, related approaches in, in uh, ACM or uh, IEEE that I think they, they, they are trying to, for example, in the ACM, they have this program that is called Artifact Review and, and Batching. That they, it's a, a fairly uh, recent uh, approach that they try to uh, create reproducible artifacts and, and validated artifacts for the papers that they publish. And they just created some badges to the, so they attach the badges to the, papers and, and also if you have the artifact they validate that the artifact is, is functional in terms of in terms of for example of a, a virtual machine so perhaps it could be interesting to see if there's similar attempts in other disciplines or uh, perhaps yeah. like that join the fort with them mm -hmm. thank you for sharing I think it's we're seeing more and more um, both publishers and professional organizations getting on board with um, requiring that that um, that authors um, include all of this information in the papers that they publish. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also some of the impetus for us teaming up with the other University of California campuses as well. Like, how can we work together? Um, I know UCSD has been thinking about this, so we said let's join forces rather than um, you know go down two separate paths. So I think that'll be the kind of first phase, and then see who else is interested in this topic. Anthony, oh, you could. Uh, <laughs> well, 